today, we're um, very lucky to have uh, Professor Anat Admadi, the George G. C. Parker Professor of Finance and Economics at Stanford. Um, she is a leading thinker on issues of corporate and government accountability and also the director of CASI. And she will be interviewing Sarah Bloom Raskin. So now I'm going to turn it over to Anat to introduce our speaker for today. We're really lucky to have with us today uh, the Honorable Sarah Bloom Raskin. She's without a doubt one of the best people to offer us insights on economic policy issues related to COVID-19. Governor Raskin is highly sought for her expertise and advice. She has responsibility as board member of Vanguard right now, CSB, CNBC commentators, much more. So I thank Governor uh, Raskin for finding the time to share her perspective with us today. Before we delve into the economic issues, policy issues, can you briefly discuss, Governor Raskin, your experience uh, transitioning from the private sector to the government and back? Again, I think you did that like two round trips like that. What were these transitions like? What did you observe about uh, these kind of issues about competence, effectiveness, uh, et cetera, in, uh, especially in government? So let me just say a bit about the, the transition. And I did have two kind of <laughs> round trips uh, in between the private sector and uh, government. Um, I am by training a banking lawyer. So after graduating law school, I went to Wall Street and uh, uh, represented financial institutions in uh, mostly transactional work. Um, came to Washington because I wanted to expand my understanding of uh, the financial sector through regulation and policy. And so my first um, my first visit really into the into the public sector was as banking counsel to the Senate Banking Committee, and that was. Uh, really in a very important experience where I you know, was able to broaden my understanding beyond a mere sort of corporate transactional um, uh, private sector perspective. Um, the second time that I actually uh, came to government was, as Professor Admati mentioned, um, when I came in um, as uh, uh, first as a banking commissioner uh, in Maryland, which I went into when the financial crisis um, started to emerge, the, the, the last financial crisis, that is, <laughs> and then um, uh, moved from being the state banking commissioner to becoming a governor on the Federal Reserve Board and then deputy secretary of the Treasury. And that, that transition was um, uh, really motivated um, by a sense of seeing really the kind of disintegration of uh, parts of our um, economy that were starting to crumble really under the weight of what was starting to emerge in the financial crisis and and frankly just wanting to wanting wanting to be part of a of a, of a solution um, wanting to not be on the side of the you know set of institutions that were part of the problem and wanting to um, to have a bigger impact and to bring my skills to bear so uh, what I did was left, I was at that point a uh, managing director at Promontory, and I um, uh, realized that in order to actually have an impact, I should go to a place uh, in government, in the public sector, where, uh, where I could, could have an impact. And that was why I became the banking commissioner in Maryland, and that was in um, 2007. Uh, the um, structures in the financial se sector uh, locally were falling apart, foreclosures were climbing, um, and the laws uh, were, were really pretty threadbare. Um, and so I wanted to bring my skills to bear to, bring, to build the policy framework, and that was what had to get done. And of course, it was a pretty, <laughs> a pretty, um, <laughs> you know, you, 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 can't, you can't get uptight about like wanting the beautiful corner office. I mean, you have to uh, you know, roll up your sleeves if you're serious about making an impact. And, you know, in my case, it was working with my um, least favorite um, uh, mammal, which are rats. I mean, we, we actually had a, um, a, an office that was infested by rats, which made it be the case that I spent most of my time on the desk, like vertically standing on the desk um, as I was conducting, uh, conducting business. But anyway, um, 
uh, it was really that work in in Maryland that uh, in which I was brought to the attention of the um, uh, White House, the last administration was looking for somebody as a governor on the Fed who would have a different perspective. And I am not a PhD in economics, so I I don't have a sort of a traditional Fed portfolio, or you know, but I had a certain set of perspectives and a certain skill set that um, that I think that uh, White House was interested in bringing in. So. That, uh, Professor Amadi, is my second foray into back into government. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, and by the way, the current uh, Fed uh, chair is also a lawyer. So Ben Bernanke was a, an economist, PhD economist, who actually was at Stanford at some point. Uh, but now we have uh, a lawyer as well uh, with a JD uh, education, previously in banking. Um, in the financial crisis of 2007 to 2009, the government response Sorry about the phone, included the Troubled Asset Relief Program, TARP, a $700 billion bill in 2008. There was also a stimulus bill that was uh, budgeted in the congressional budget by, uh, at about $787 billion. We're going to start talking trillion soon. Um, and the Federal Reserve and the Treasury were um, the, the top agencies that were bodies that were executing all these policies. By the time you became a Fed governor in 2010, uh, Governor Raskin, it had a balance sheet of about $4 trillion, which is about four times what it had before the financial crisis. Can you comment briefly on what you stepped into when you came into the Fed after the financial crisis in 2010 with a $4 trillion balance sheet and all kinds of policies, QEs and other things? Right. So that's just a great observation. And we all should pause on that now and, and kind of chew over what that means. In 2010, the balance sheet was $4 trillion. Now, of course, we're in the midst of another crisis, which I know we're going to talk about um, with some depth. But the balance sheet is being projected after this um, crisis just by the end of the year to be more than double the size of what it was um, in 2010. So it's being projected as a $9 trillion balance sheet. Um, but anyway, what I, what I stepped into, of course, was this, this um, uh, continuous set of monetary accommodation efforts. So in 2010, you'll remember that um, the Fed had launched its first round of quantitative easing. Um, it was in the midst in 2010 of moving into continuous uh, quantitative easing with no end in sight. Um, so why was this necessary? Well, it was necessary because at the time, the financial crisis um, had triggered a recession um, and the Fed needed to pour in liquidity in order to attempt to get the real economy moving. Um, and it's, again, it's, just, it's really worth pausing over the comparison between where we are now and where um, the Fed was back then. And just as a point, you know, just as a point in time, the Fed right now has engaged in quantitative easing in the midst of this pandemic that is already exceeding what it had done two thirds of the way through its, its complete quantitative easing program um, during the financial crisis. So again, you see, you know, you, 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 you start to see the, 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 the um, uh, contrast here. But it does mean that when I did come to the Fed, um, there was a big balance sheet that was growing, um, and there was going to be, as there needed to be, uh, some recognition of how it was going to eventually get unwound, what was going to transpire actually what kind of decisions needed to get made what would the strategy be to start unwinding that balance sheet now um, again the discussions were very minimal because the fed was still in the midst of you know so putting out the flames and so the um the efforts were really quite quite uh still quite significant on the, um, you know, sort of on, on, on engaging with the quantitative easing piece. The other thing I just want to make an observation on back in 2010 to sort of fully answer your question, Professor Admati, is the um, some cultural 
observations, right? So um, I mentioned that I, I was not the kind of typical governor coming into uh, the Fed at the time, and as a result of that, <laughs> I guess that was the case. I, I noticed that there were a different, um, you know, there was a different way in which people proceeded at the Fed, and again, it is mostly economists. Yes, today there is a Fed chair who is not um, an economist, but the uh, predominant uh, staff member uh, is a is an economist. And, um, you know, as a result, the, you know, my observations were that this was a, a different kind of atmosphere. Um, uh, the perspective of the economist is different uh, than the perspective of other uh, disciplines. And one example of that, and I'll, you know, I'll end with, <laughs> with this and then let you go on, but the, um, you know, at the time, there was, you know, I don't know if many, many people remember, but there was a movement called Occupy Wall Street which was um, a grassroots movement. It had started, obviously, on you know, Wall Street. It had been people uh, who were enraged about having lost their homes and the fact that Wall Street had been bailed out um, ahead of um, a lot of households. Well, well, Occupy Wall Street came to Washington and came to the Fed and, in fact, was ringing around. They had set up um, some of their, uh, some of their um, uh, structures, their little tents, you know, outside the Fed. And I remember saying to some economists inside the Fed, wow, I mean, what do we make of this? I mean, what, what, what are we, you know, how do we in the Fed engage with this, um, with, with these ideas that are coming from the Occupy Wall Street movement? And the answer I got, which is an answer that an economist will give you a lot of times is, well, that's a political issue. We don't engage in politics. So we, we really have nothing to say or engage with, with those people. So I thought that was one kind of interesting cultural um, uh, cultural difference. And then, of course, I, you know, I had some different ideas, and we can talk later about how I, um, you know, and, and, and sort of how when you bring a different perspective in, how you can move some of the perspectives of these institutions. I think later, actually, there was a, a move called Occupy Fed, uh, Occupy the Fed as well. Uh, and it was occupied SEC, et cetera. So let's move to today. Uh, the CARES Act, so this is Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security, authorized so far $2.8 trillion to various programs. More is coming, I hear. It gives extraordinary authority to Treasury and the Federal Reserve. The Fed already has a lot of authority, essentially unlimited to lend in an emergency anyway. Uh, even without uh, additional authorization, but it has even more authorization um, now to do more backed by Treasury. I am hoping that uh, the governor can come on video at some point so you can see her lovely face. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, the balance sheet of the Fed is not projected to be, as was already sort of hinted at, uh, at something like nine trillion, maybe even more than 10 trillion. I mean, these are just un admirable amount, spectacular. Governor Raskin, um, so now this is going to be a big question. We can maybe try to go a little back and forth because there's a lot to unpack here. Given your rich experiences and knowledge of the institutions involved, can you help us unpack a little bit of these policy responses? I mean, what is there? What does it all mean? Uh, are they well designed? How are we going to, how are we implementing all of them? Uh, what does it mean the Fed owns so many assets? Uh, what does it mean for what we teach here in finance courses? We do have a few finance faculty here uh, present. We'll talk about it later. And you know, you mentioned liquidity. Why they're referring to investment in risky assets as liquidity? That sounds kind of fancy. Anyway, maybe start by describing the key pieces of the program, and then maybe kind of as you go along, evaluate a little bit what you like, what you don't like, what you're concerned with, etc. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, sure. And I am trying to get in so that I can um, be seen, um, and I continue to <laughs> work on that. So let me let me highlight some of the uh, different categories uh, that constitute the CARES Act, and we can actually have a discussion um, about any of these pieces. But let me first outline them all, and um, and then why don't we um, why don't we pause and probe some of them? Come on, and maybe somebody else can comment too. That's that's great. That's great. So um, there, the, the way I um, 
understand them actually come from my prior roles. <laughs> so there is a treasury piece, which I would have implemented had I um, uh, been at treasury. And there is a Fed piece, which I would have implemented had I been at the Fed. So there are two, um, sort of these two components um, that um, are implemented by different economic age, economic policymakers. So one of the uh, pieces that is uh, implemented by Treasury is the so-called PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program. And this is a program that um, uh, has had a rocky start, to say the least. Uh, quite has been quite problematic. But the, the idea behind it was essentially to provide small businesses um, a, um, a loan that would become forgivable um, if the business held on to uh, employees. The idea here was that, um, that we wanted, uh, we, that the Congress wanted to hold, um, firm, give firms the ability to not have to lay off workers. Uh, the idea from a macro economy is that when you lay off workers, it's extremely hard to uh, re-employ people. Um, that the uh, economy's uh, bounce back would have been completely hindered if um, unemployment were to climb. Now, of course, we know in hindsight that the unemployment rate has climbed, that the numbers of claims are extraordinary. But at the time that PPP was launched, the idea was to give small businesses the ability to hold on to their employees, incentivize them in such a way that they would hold on to their employees by saying, your loans will become forgivable, will become grants, in other words. So that's essentially the PPP program, a big part of the CARES Act. Um, another part of the CARES Act, this part also implemented by Treasury, um, are industry-specific um, uh, industry specific assistance, right? So here you've got money going to the airlines, uh, to air cargo, to particular national security companies. Um, these were considered um, firms that uh, needed particular direct assistance, and this also was a Treasury implemented piece. A third piece of the CARES Act. Um, also implemented by Treasury, are the direct uh, cash contributions. And this is the so-called $1,200 check for people who make under $1,000 a year. The idea behind uh, these payments were to actually help households uh, uh, weather the storm. Uh, the idea being that uh, people were facing uh, quite a bit of duress. They had been forced to stay home. Um, because the uh, pandemic was uh, demanding that people not engage in, um, uh, you know, so, be, be in, so, in close social proximity. They needed to stay home. Businesses had to close. And as a result, people were going to be suffering, and they were going to continue to have financial needs. The idea behind this one-time payment was that the financial needs would be provided um, through this uh, one-time payment that would be implemented by Treasury. Also, rocky, rocky, rocky implementation, and we can talk about that. Um, a fourth piece, um, I think quite a significant um, uh, uh, part of the CARES Act is the enhancement to unemployment insurance. So every state has an unemployment insurance office. Um, the um, uh, idea behind this part of the CARES Act is to enhance the ability of people to come in and make a claim and be able to uh, tap into unemployment insurance. Uh, the traditional unemployment, pre pandemic way unemployment insurance was distributed was uh, if you lost your job, uh, you would be able to get unemployment insurance. Now, of course, the labor market has changed significantly, and we can talk about that a bit later, but um, the labor market moved in such a way that the unemployment insurance scheme has not kept up with it. And so what Congress is trying to do in this part of the bill is to expand the ability of people to tap into unemployment insurance, uh, even if they don't have a traditional relationship with an employer. 
part of the you know, so-called gig economy, they can tap in. If they have had their hours cut, you know, but they haven't um, uh, been completely laid off, they could take advantage of the unemployment insurance system. So there were, there's an enhancement factor here that Congress was trying to put in place. Um, that I should say also rocky implementation, and that's primarily because the states have not all uniformly maintained their UI systems. And remember, everything is being done online here, so people's ability to um, uh, to uh, connect into a UI system that itself may not be fully um, have not has not been fully um, updated has been causing significant delays in many states. And then the last piece is really the Senate piece, okay? And this is the piece of the CARES Act where Treasury and the Fed are, are coming into close proximity, right? So essentially you've got Treasury here backstopping um, in the amount of roughly $454 billion, actions that the Fed will be taking through the establishment of particular so-called liquidity facilities. So the Fed is, has triggered something called 13-3, it's emergency lending facilities. Um, you might have heard about some of them. One is called the Main Street Lending Program. Um, another is called um, something much more, much more of a mouthful, the you know, primary market corporate credit facility and now there's a secondary market corporate credit facility. Both of those, by the way, were launched just yesterday. Um, these are all new facilities that the Fed put in place using its emergency authority, and Treasury is involved. Treasury has a role in um, backstopping what the Fed is doing here. The Fed is going to scale up um, beyond the amount of the guarantee but already there have been uh, quite a bit of controversial decisions made in these lending facilities, and we can talk about that. So those are, those, that's roughly the outline of uh, the Treasury pieces and the Fed pieces. And let me just pause there to, um, yeah. you know, to get a reaction. I'm going to call on uh, already on uh, my colleague Amit Saru, who is here. He uh, interviewed. Uh, Treasury Secretary uh, Olson, who was involved back in 2008 uh, and also was participant in a CASI event faculty debate on bailouts, uh, which went to some of these issues about who do we go through and who intermediates bailouts and uh, what is it about and who benefits and all that. Uh, Professor Saru. Uh, uh, thanks, Anath, and uh, thank you. Uh... Uh, Secretary uh, Raskin for joining us. Uh, seems like yesterday we were debating when you had come as a Cassie visitor on uh, uh, cybersecurity as being the biggest risk facing the U.S. economy. And uh, <laughs> so that's how much uh, we economists can predict. Uh, but uh, I had like two sets of questions. And I think uh, some of what you said already kind of uh, uh, gets at it, but it would be good to hear uh, a little bit more. Uh, when I was uh, uh, interviewing uh, Secretary Paulson, uh, it seemed very natural for him to think that in this time where, uh, I, I wouldn't like to call it a stimulus plan, I think it's more like an insurance plan that we are doing right now to pause and uh, protect the economy and the uh, capacity that we have. Uh, uh, but he seemed to think very naturally that Fed and the banking sector had a central role to play and it was very strange for me to see that. Now, it's partly because of the kind of things that you were mentioning, that maybe the infrastructure we have uh, is not geared. So we naturally think about banking and Fed as a mechanism. Uh, but I was uh, wanting, so one set of question is just, is that your natural inclination too, that if we have to provide insurance, if you have to provide certain things, that Fed and banking is the best way to do it? And uh, going forward, what would be, uh, your sort of uh, way of thinking about this. Those are excellent observations, and I would start, uh, first of all, by commending, uh, commending you on the distinction, really, between an insurance reaction and a stimulus reaction. This is not a stimulus. <laughs> this, uh, it's been called that because this is, you know, um, 
people just use the words that come to mind, and they're using the words of the last crisis. But um, but uh, you are right that this is um, a different kind of reaction, and it's a reaction that that is addressing and is becoming more costly as a result um, of the fact that we are dealing with an extremely fragile um, economy, that we are going in, we have gone into this pandemic um, much more weak than uh, we should have, I would would argue. And, you know, your point also about the – mechanisms that were used and the, and the fact that banks are going to be used um, or the banks have been used as the, you know, vehicle for the PPP uh, program. Um, the banks are used always as this, um, as the, as the conduit. And, you know, and by the way, on the unemployment insurance side, you're using the mechanisms, you know, in the 50 states. Those aren't banks, but you're using what is there. And, you know, I, I, I think that what has happened here is that in early days of the response, uh, the existing tools, the existing mechanisms are just used. There's no time to create something better. Um, And so if you think that this is going to be a short-term problem, you you, you, you resort to the tools you've got. So the banks are used and the existing unemployment insurance mechanism is used, for example. And I think that that makes sense for um, short-term, for short-term crises. But as we now see, this is really a much more long-term uh, set of issues that are going to be left here. I don't think there are many people who believe this to be a V-shaped um, economy uh, rebound anymore. <clears throat> and the need for more and more and more um, financial assistance is really put in, it's going to put into sharp question exactly what you have pointed out, which is why these existing mechanisms, which are so inefficient, or I should say are, in, are inefficient in certain ways and flawed in certain ways, are going to continue to be used. Um, it was, there was a really interesting proposal early on um, which I knew wasn't going to get anywhere, but, you know, when you look back, is one that could have been much more efficient, which is to, instead of using the banks as the conduit for uh, delivering, uh, delivering these PPP funds, um, why not just take over the payment processors? So, in other words, you take a big payment processor like ADP, which I think covers roughly 40% of the workforce anyway, and send those directions over to Treasury and have Treasury just make the payments instead of the payments coming from the, you know, from the business owners. They would come right from, um, right from Treasury. There are mechanisms that really could have been uh, much more efficient and, frankly, would have been better from a long term perspective in the sense that this is not a, um, uh, a problem that is going away anytime soon. It, couldn't, it, it can't be solved with just one round of PPP, and we've already seen the number of times that program has gone through iterations. You know, similarly on the direct cash piece, um, query as to whether uh, more, more cash assistance is going to be necessary, and are we going to go through exactly that same cumbersome mechanism of trying to get checks into the, uh, into the bank accounts for people who have bank accounts and then figure out how to get money into people who are, you know, who are unbanked, how do they get their funds? You know, maybe it's time to be looking to some of the mechanisms, the alternative, the more efficient ways of delivering assistance. So I think I think you raised just a really, really good point, and, it's, and I think your point becomes even more salient as uh, this crisis um, shows no indication yet of turning the corner. So um, uh, I think some of these proposals need to be uh, brushed off, but you know, I guess I would say, why was it done the way it was done? I mean, everything was in a hurry, as it always is, right? There were no, there were no hearings. 
There were no there was no deliberation. There was no real time for discussions of alternatives. So what do policymakers do? They they use what they did before. They pick up what they've got before, and this is what they had before, and this is what they use. Okay, I'm going to ask a combined question, sort of before we move to student questions. Um, so crises often bring reform. So uh, just uh, the last crisis, when you came into the Fed, um, there was a Dodd-Frank Act. Uh, it's actually never fully been implemented. In fact, some of it was rolled back. So you were there where Treasury and the Fed as a regulator were part of a system of implementing this enormous law from 2010. And uh, so, you know, the first part of the question, but I'll let you answer it together, is did we learn the lessons from the last crisis? And now we have like this even bigger crisis that we're experiencing. And the question is, how are we gonna come out of it when whenever we do, we're still living it and there's no end in sight. But uh, one of the issues that came up already in this class as well is we're coming into this crisis and you said the system is fragile, uh, a system where people talk a lot about inequality inequality in income, inequality in wealth, inequality of opportunities. Former Secretary uh, Rice, Condoleezza Rice, who visited this class, uh, mentioned the inequality in the way people can respond to this crisis. Some people can work from home or study from home, and some people uh, can just afford not to work at all, um, and go hiding in fancy places where some people have to go out there, and they're the ones that are being endangered and also cannot stand the lockdown and all of that. As we come out of this, as, or as we live through this, uh, how do you think both the policy responses and the development uh, might fare in terms of um, so reducing or maybe exacerbating the, the problems that we uh, already have? Also in terms of healthcare uh, reforms, which were way back, we're discussing the primaries in terms of people only getting uh, healthcare through employers and then they lose their job, they lose the health insurance. So all of those systems, uh, that we have healthcare and other uh, types of uh, uh, structures of the economy. How do you think, uh, might we reform them or th they are, might, they, they, might the situation get worse, et cetera? Your thoughts, thank you. Yes, yes. So one observation coming, you know, coming through and being in the middle of the pandemic is, you know, that, you know, it has exposed the fact that really um, the best paid workers may not be the most essential. <laughs> um, and, we, you know, we, we have come in to a, um, you know, we entered the pandemic with, with great, uh, what I'd call heterogeneities in big disparities in wealth and income. Uh, the people who are on the front line, the healthcare workers in particular, um, uh, uh, themselves uh, have have not been um, compensated, you know, particularly well for the essential work that they are doing. That's that's actually, a, you know, an issue is that why, you know, how it is we are in a system that, um, you know, again, the most essential workers are not the ones um, who are we are compensating. Um, we're, we're applauding them quite a bit. We give them a lot of nice applause, but we don't we don't compensate them. Um, let me say something about uh, income inequality more generally, and 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 I think that the response here, one of the effects of the way this economic response is moving, um, is that we will be exacerbating um, income inequality. We thought it was wide before the U.S. Uh, was one of the top uh, countries in terms of disparities in wealth and income going into the pandemic. Um, I think coming out of it, we will see that widen. So um, uh, particularly on the bottom, we're seeing a lot of people slipping from uh, the uh, middle class down into levels of poverty. There are areas where, where people um, are standing in food lines, um, uh, particularly children um, in food lines, getting, uh, trying to pick up uh, food for their, their families to bring home. Um, the amount of food insecurity has increased um, the um, uh, uh, numbers of people in poverty uh, has, has increased. Now, why this is a result of the, you know, of the pandemic response is really what we were talking about before, the differential speed really between 
the economic responses. So the Fed's response has been very quick um, and has served to bolster markets in various ways. That assistance gets out the door very quickly. I mean, the Fed doesn't even have to implement a lot of times. They can just promise that they're going to do it. They have such high, a high degree of credibility in the market that um, are able to bolster markets um, almost instantaneously. And that um, contrasts with the fumbles and the friction points that exist on the Treasury side, where Treasury attempts to get these direct cash payments out the door, and they don't go quickly, or when they do go, they get intercepted by debt collectors. Or the, you know, the PPP program, which is jointly a Treasury and a Small Business Administration program, and you know that that website at the SBA is just a, <laughs> it's almost a joke. I mean, it's, it's, it's so challenged in terms of being able to stay up. It's actually, I think, I, I always thought, I always thought the, uh, you know, my system was better than the SBA's, although after today, I can see that my system needs work because I have not been able to get a connection myself. But anyway, the, um, the speed with which the uh, economic recovery is happening is going to value and going to um, uh, enhance the well-being of asset holders, so people who own particular equities, uh, particular uh, uh, bonds, particular asset classes, those holders will benefit um, ahead of people who are waiting for their checks to come in from Treasury. So this is going to, um, I'm afraid, not go away when the pandemic is over because, of course, we're going we're gonna to have this massive amount of unemployment that we're going to have to figure out what to, you know, how to handle. Um, and, and we're going to uh, have a balance sheet. Uh, the Fed is going to have a huge balance sheet that is going to need to get unwound um, and until it gets unwound is going to continue to enhance the um, the well-being of uh, people fortunate enough to be invested in stock market. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to move to a, a few student questions, and uh, I'm going to call on Ben Roxen to ask maybe uh, your second question. You asked two of them. Uh, both of them are very good, but we want to make sure to have time for everything. So, Ben. My question is: uh, If a divided Congress can't pass a uh, another economic aid package? Um, should the Fed continue to take kind of ever more drastic and unconventional actions, uh, despite some of the risks that, that you've mentioned in terms of like moral hazard and the lack of oversight that kind of the Fed has from, um, from democratically elected officials? Well, Ben, that's an excellent question. And I'm not sure I will have the answer to it. Um, I have to say one of the most disappointing um, uh, features of this uh, response to the pandemic has been the lack of preparedness um, that, that it has exposed, right? And, and when I say that and I talk about the fragility of the economy going in, I also mean the fact that we have done so little to make sure that delivery mechanisms that the government has that the government needs and uses in times of crisis like this are invested in properly. Um, it, it, is, it is really, um, it's, it's heartbreaking to see the brokenness of the uh, commitment to investing in government functions that become so critical at a time like this. And you can see now, we can all see how relevant uh, that investment is, um, you know, and, and, and it has, it, it has it, it's going to have an impact. Now, uh, you also talk about this, this divided, you know, having a, you know, a Congress that maybe can't pass a fourth economic a package, and that goes to another feature that is a disappointment, which is how it is that uh, we in this country always wait till it's too late. We never seem to be able to tackle issues ahead of their 
falling into, um, you know, into major catastrophes. And, and, and we've seen this, like, repeatedly. Um, we've seen it, you know, in, in the financial crisis. Frankly, we see it in terms of climate change. I mean, if, if, you, if, if, if it's not a problem that has tipped us into catastrophe, we do nothing about it. Okay, and the cost associated with addressing it after the fact are simply astronomical. And they don't need to be. We are losing lives. We are losing a sense of economic vibrancy. We are losing the spirit of entrepreneurship. We are losing the ability of markets to, to, to signal and, um, and, and create uh, pricing that, that brings about a robust economy with competition, we are losing all of that simply because we waited too late. And, and when I think about waiting too late, I think about it from the perspective of, the, uh, you know, of, of our public health, which is also a sector that was completely underinvested in, but also our economic mechanisms, our economic safety net, so to speak, which completely was stripped bare. So, um, so that that is that doesn't answer your question, um, but but you know I I I am reluctant <laughs> to um, uh, have there be no response to the crisis, um, but we have to keep in mind that when the Fed, if the Fed is the only game in town, which is what your hypothetical poses here. I think there are problems with that. That is not a perfect tool. Um, and you pointed out one, it's not a, um, you know, certainly not a democratically elected uh, entity. Uh, and that's by design. So, you know, query as to which constituents it becomes, um, uh, you know, what, which, which constituents it's going to serve first or how its tools are going to be directed to an inclusive economic recovery. The Fed is really, it can't be it. And yet we see what is happening or what could happen, which is the Fed becomes the main game in town. And that just can't be uh, permanently sustainable, both for reasons of democratic accountability, but also in terms of getting a, an inclusive, robust um, economy moving again. So that is a phenomenon that happened since the last financial crisis. The central banks became, I mean, Kevin Worth come to my class, and he was a governor too, and he says, well, the Fed moved from page 17 of the B section to front page, and they like it. So he talks about uh, the Fed becoming so important. We have a question here from uh, Jenna um, Morgan Stern Gaines. Hey, thank you so much. Um, thanks so much, Secretary Raskin. Really appreciate you being here with us. Um, so my question uh, goes back to um, your expertise in cybersecurity, uh, which Professor Sir also brought up earlier. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, since COVID has highlighted how vulnerable we are to, to cyber threats through either fake news that has resulted in people dying from taking the wrong medicine or hackers exploiting fears of uh, the pandemic to steal personal data or finances, um, I'm wondering, since this is such a classic area that requires collaboration between the public and private sector, how you think uh, those two sectors can work together to better protect people from cyber threats during COVID and, and beyond? Oh, thank you, Jenna. That's a great observation. And again, you know, there are mechanisms that actually we established in the um, last administration that created a, not just a private sector, public sector forum for addressing cyber threats, but um, we also set it up internationally so that we um, had with our G7 counterparts common uh, principles for how to manage through, from a defensive perspective, the threats that uh, could be presented and that continue to be presented. Um, so, uh, so you're right that uh, the the cyber threat has has now sort of gone through you know gone through the roof. Uh, again, I think that had those mechanisms of private sector public sector coordination stayed intact, 
uh, we would be in a position that would be strong. We'd be stronger now. And I should say that the work I did was focused on cybersecurity in the financial sector, which was plenty broad. But we needed to engage also in that same collaboration with other critical infrastructures, such as the telecommunications sector, the energy sector. Um, uh, in particular, and though that work, um, as far as I know, did not continue um, in this last administration, um, again, I think a, a, a really regrettable um, set of uh, set of cutbacks. I'm afraid. So, um, but that is the, that's what's necessary. That collaboration, you um, you build it in good times, and it should be there for you when times get rough. I wanted to ask what you thought um, about some of the recent actions the Fed has taken along the lines of buying some of the liquid uh, investment grade ETFs and uh, if you think that they're starting to get outside the scope of the Federal Reserve Act and what do you think, if you do think that, uh, what do you think the implications are of some of these actions? Oh, Alex, thank you. Great observation. and. Um, yes, I have been um, I have been focused on the uh, corporate bond purchasing that the Fed has launched through these two new facilities, um, and actually just started yesterday, but they announced it a while ago. And I'm particularly troubled by the fact that the Fed is 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 open to the idea of taking in less than investment grade um, uh, debt. So you put your finger on, I think, a, a, a really uh, troublesome aspect. Now, let me, you know, let me be um, balanced on this and say, first of all, what the Fed is trying to do. The Fed is, you know, essentially you know, saying that it wants to buy up um, corporate debt so that it gives the uh, entities the companies that have issued the debt um, an ability to stay afloat and be able to pay their bills and keep their payroll and be able to um, contain a larger um, cascading uh, effect of uh, unemployment and laying people off. So that's the Fed's theory. Um, the the problem with that theory is that when you, particularly when you dip beneath the um, investment grade um, threshold, but really even at the investment grade threshold, it's not been proven that this is essentially what those firms and debt, hold, uh, debt holders are going to do with the money, right? So they're going to get cash, uh, but it's not obvious that with that cash they're going to hold on to employees. It's uh, just as equally plausible that they will use it to um, avoid having, for example, to draw down on their lines of credit, which they might have with banks, but they might be saving for some other reason. Um, they also may be taking on that money to do some things like, uh, you know, pay their CEOs more um, or to engage in particular um, uh, dividend buybacks or dividends or, 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 or stock buyback programs. So the uh, empirical work hasn't been done on this. And, and you're right, Alex, also to point out that this is unprecedented for the Fed. Okay, now there have been a couple of other central banks that have dipped their toes into buying corporate debt, but when the Fed does it, it's a big deal. And this, I think, is going to be the subject of a lot of um, academic and policy research for, for years to come because it is so new and it is being done presumably at such a massive level um, and its consequences are not known. And it is um, costly. This is, by the way, these are a couple of the facilities that are being backstopped by the Treasury, meaning that um, you know, ultimately taxpayers are, are on the hook for this and this, these facilities are getting in line, are getting ahead of other facilities, right? So we might say, well, hmm, do we really want to be bailing out private equity ahead of some of the state and local municipal bond issuances that the Fed is also looking at, or ahead of some of the businesses that are eligible pursuant to the Main Street Lending Program. Um, 
Right. So the uh, so the um, questions that you raise are good ones, and they're ones that I've been looking at quite closely, and I'm um, pretty sure that others are going to start questioning as well. I think we're on now solved her connection problem. She too had connection problem, and we see her uh, here. You can't, uh, Sarah, but uh, Governor Raskin, but Laura, please. The question was about unemployment in the midterm of one to two years or longer. So with travel, hospitality, and restaurants being large industries, if we don't resume those activities, what happens to those businesses and the employees? And in particular, your suggestion that Treasury could undertake direct payroll more efficiently. I'm also curious, is that possible to implement and what would it take? Thank you. Um, I'm um, pretty pessimistic on the prospects of um, where we're going to be for medium term and long term unemployment. I know that there are um, there are others who believe that these um, numbers are going to uh, disappear pretty rapidly, the numbers of unemployed. I am not so certain um, because uh, the people who are unemployed have to go somewhere. They have to go to firms or go into businesses. They have to be hired. And who's going to, you know, where do we see the resurgence really of hiring occurring? I also know um, and was very troubled during the response to the financial crisis, the last crisis, when it, when we saw, you know, quite a bit of unemployment, not at these levels, but quite a bit of unemployment. It did reach 12% after all at its peak. And a lot of firms realized that they were not seeing re restored consumer demand for their products. And so they were slow to rehire. Um, the, the rehiring prospects were very um, very low, and it took a long time to bring unemployment down. And um, I fear that we are going to have that situation again because um, the ability of firms to hire now is is quite questionable given that a lot of firms can't even reopen. And when they do reopen, um, you know, are they going to want to be taking on board all the employees that they laid off? Um, do employees, it, 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 you know, as consumers, actually have money to be spending right now as well? So I'm concerned, as it sounds like you may be, that the medium-term and long-term prospects uh, for unemployment, um, I think, are not are not looking are not looking great. And I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? The second part was, um, and by the way, thank you for those thoughts um, and the concern. I guess. Is there anything to solve? Oh, yeah, the payroll process. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. I think so, yeah. That I actually think, I think there's, I think that would be, it would be a great mechanism to use the payroll processors or to use the IRS, for example, you know, use the IRS, which I was part of the tre my treasury jurisdiction, um, to bring about a quicker delivery of assistance. To people. By the way, the you know the IRS does this all the time. It you know it sends in it sends refund checks to individuals. It sends in social security benefits or Medicare payments. I mean there is a system that can be used, and you know maybe we need to first of all make sure that that system has been sufficiently invested in so that it can work without uh, cyber attacks and without glitches and without shutdowns. I mean we could you know first of all make sure it's been sufficiently invested in and then bring it to a point where we could use it. So I think there are other mechanisms, and I do like the payroll processing mechanism. There's a, you know, there's, there, you know, the devil is in the details. There's going to have to be some real implementation work done on this. It's not something I'm sure that's ready to be rolled out, but it is a mechanism that we know works in the private sector. Um, why could we not, you know, um, sort of retrofit it to uh, be used more broadly? So I do like those suggestions, um, and um, and I, you know, to, to you know to, to some of the earlier observations, we may be we may need some longer term investment made in government right now because I think these uh, the effects of the pandemic are not going away anytime soon.
Okay, well, I think we might have just one more student questions and then we're gonna sort of wrap up and try to go uh, in, into the brief. Uh, we have Izzy Ernst. Thank you so much for taking the time, Governor. I'm curious if you could comment on the current conversation about how Congress and the Fed's response to the crisis ties to modern monetary theory. Um, are we seeing that deficit, deficits haven't been as big of a constraint in responding to the crisis as some were expecting? And also, should we be concerned about inflation? Ah, great question. Okay. So I'm going to just take them one by one. First, the new monetary theory and then inflation. The new monetary theory, you know, you, you'll, you'll see the people who are the proponents of it um, talking about the fact that um, it's actually, this is the practice case for it. They'll say, look what's happened. You don't see deficits um, mattering. You see essentially that um, – uh, you know, that the Fed is spending, Treasury is spending, Treasury bonds are being issued, being bought up. There's, you know, there's um, uh, a test case, the, the, the uh, new monetary theorists would say. My own view on that is it's too early to say. Um, I think this is truly an experiment, um, you know, in the sense that we are blowing through deficits uh, deficit levels never before had never before been encountered um, uh, in the U.S. and uh, we are seeing a level of spending that uh, uh, we've never engaged in before in such a short period of time, um, and so in, a, in a very compressed period of time. So it is an interesting uh, case study. I just think we don't know, though, what the longer-term effects are going to be on it. So I, I think it's really worth looking at closely. Um, I would not be dismissing it, but I also don't think it's time to declare that this theory uh, replaces um, uh, the, the, the more, um, you know, neoclassical uh, um, orthodox economic theories of deficits. Uh, namely deficits crowding out private investment and such. So um, thank you for raising it and keep an eye on it. Uh, don't, don't, uh, don't let your guard down on that. I would, I, would, I would watch that. There will be a lot of discussion in that space. Your question on inflation, um, uh, the, my take is the outlook for, um, for inflation, um, uh, certainly in the short and medium term is still, um, uh, we're in a highly deflationary environment. So um, you see uh, the uh, demand has been flattened so much that even though supply has also been constricted, demand is so low now that the real fear is uh, deflation. And that in fact has been what has been experienced. Uh, the latest inflation numbers are, are pathetically low. Uh, they are nowhere near even the Fed's pre-pandemic 2% target, uh, clear as to when they will reach that number. Uh, so I think in the short and medium term, definitely we're still in a deflation mode. That said, um, a lot of people are scratching their heads at what the longer term inflation projections would be because, of course, uh, longer term, uh, we, we see that there, we've just flooded the economy with liquidity. I mean, there are just huge, the amount of money that was spent essentially in a two month period is um, unprecedented. And so, from a, uh, you know, from a, a classical perspective on how you look at uh, deficit spending and how, in, how price levels respond. Uh, you might expect in the longer term inflation to resume. And I get this question a lot um, right now. People really can't understand how we could still, how, it, how things could still be so deflationary. But you've got to remember um, the economy is not functioning. It is, you know, large swaths of it are essentially um, uh, flat. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a disaster scene, okay? So um, you just don't, do not have the demand that you would need uh, typically to see in an inflationary scenario. 
Now, there might be different things that, that push it up. Right? If we move to, if we have, um, you know, if there's, ever, if there's pressure on wages, perhaps. Now, again, how is there going to be pressure on wages when now we have massive num numbers of people who are unemployed? Will there really be, you know, wage pressure? Um, commodity prices, that's been another traditional source of inflation. Well, certainly the main commodity, oil, um, has been flattened out. So query as to whether that commodity you know, price is going to push inflation up. So we really, um, I, I don't see many people who are projecting long-term, um, I, I should say short and medium-term um, inflation to return. And I should also say financial market indicators are not pointing to it. If you look at TIPS, which are um, an inflation index treasury uh, instrument, you don't see um, them uh, um, reflecting a inflation rate uh, even close to 2% yet. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, all these uh, insights that you offered us. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. We're sorry we couldn't see you. But, uh, um, but we really appreciate your availability and uh, all you contributed. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for asking such challenging questions, relevant questions. Bravo to Cassie for um, really leading the way in in um, in answering what we're going to need to answer if we're going to bring about a um, uh, you know really an economy and a and a and a country that works for everybody. So thank you for having me. And I'm sorry I couldn't see people as well. Um, and maybe there'll be a next time. But thank you for the invitation. And let me just add a, a thanks on behalf of the course. Um, uh, it's been great to have you here. These are obviously incredibly important issues as we think about the intersection between um, business and society. Um, financial system is is key. So thank you so much on behalf of the class. We do have here Professor Finance and my colleague and co-author, Professor Fleiderer, and we also have uh, Heiner Schultz, who is a lecturer, who's an investor actually, and a political scientist who I teach a course with. And so uh, I they might offer some observations or some uh, whatever their impressions are and we can uh, also take uh, take students comments uh, uh, as, as we go until the end of class or even uh, even beyond if uh, people want to stay so uh, Professor Fleider do you have any comments on what you heard or something you want to add to what she said because she didn't have time to discuss all the issues so I, I would just uh, say that as I was sitting here, I'll make this very quick. I was, I was picturing uh, a hill. And at the top of the hill, you have two giant water towers. Uh, one of them is labeled the Fed and the other is the Treasury. And then down this hill, you have a street with a bunch of houses on both sides. And at the bottom of the street, there are a bunch of houses that are burning. So you got to get the water from the Fed uh, reservoir and from the Treasury reservoir down the street. And as you pump that water down, actually you don't have to pump it, you can just let gravity uh, have it flow in the pipes, you have a bunch of homeowners that are up at the top, basically tapping into the pipe and taking a lot of the water. As uh, you probably know, uh, there was this Colorado firm, Ur Energy, uh, that was trying to get PPP. Uh, they weren't affected at all by COVID, but this is a homeowner at the top of the hill just saying, you know, I'd like my, my lawn to be watered, and so I need some of that water. And by the time you get down to the end of the street, uh, there's not enough water going to where it's really needed. Uh, obviously, the people that are really suffering with homes that are burning and uh, the hospitals that are also on fire that need medical supplies and so on and so forth. So that's the image that I was sort of conjuring up as I was listening to this. And uh, the sad thing is we did have a crisis in 2008-2009, and uh, we did rely on this leaky system uh, to get money uh, where it goes or where it should go. Uh, but, but that was a different crisis. Now we really need to get the money. Those pipes really have to work. We didn't fix the system uh, the first time around. And uh, I'm, I'm not actually that sanguine that we're going to fix it this time around either. But we really need to think about some of these other ways to uh, uh, provide. And I, I think it was very good that it was called uh, insurance. And it's, 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 it's an insurance payoff 
uh, that we have when we have an implicit contract here. In any event, uh, I, I just throw that image out. Uh, big, big reservoirs at the top, uh, houses that are burning at the bottom of the street, but everyone's trying to tap in and get their, their lawns watered. Yeah, I think yesterday we were kind of half joking about how one of the key items in the report on the new bond buying program was that Altria, the cigarette company, was happily, you know, selling its bond to the Fed and, and borrowing some more. So uh, the Fed is en en enabling all of that. Uh, Dr. Schultz, do you have any comments? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Very good. Three very brief comments uh, on the Fed mandate, uh, the high yield uh, question, and finally on modern monetary theory. Um, so as we just heard, the Fed is now uh, not just the monetary lender of last resort, but also the commercial bank of last resort. And it's in the business of picking winners and losers, which is something that's really new. The point I want to make is one that uh, we uh, focus on in the course that we're teaching together is that this new uh, uh, goal, this new task of the Fed will be subject to intense lobbying, which will only go in one direction, uh, to expand the Fed's fiscal mandate. Um, we've already seen this as munis and with high yield credit. So in the muni space, for example, initially uh, the, uh, the program jointly designed by the Treasury and the Fed called for support uh, of states and, uh, and uh, municipalities with 2 million and 1 million uh, population uh, minimum. It's an arbitrary criterion which led to the perverse effect that San Bernardino County in California, which went you know, through the crisis relatively well, was eligible for Fed support, whereas Nassau County on Long Island, one of the worst affected counties, was not eligible for Fed support. So that led to a lot of lobbying, and uh, lo and behold, a few weeks later, the Fed did lower the uh, uh, eligibility criteria to uh, 500,000 for states and 250,000 for cities. Uh, we will see more of that. Uh, secondly, or second example would be higher yield credit. Um, and the, the, uh, one point I want to make here is to that question that uh, 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 Sarah Blomraskin didn't really address why the Fed did this. The reason the Fed went beyond uh, or stretched the boundaries of, its, uh, of the Federal Reserve Act uh, to buy high yield credit, which, you know, in principle, it, uh, it is not allowed to do, is to address the so-called fallen angel problems. Uh, so those are investment grade companies that through a downgrading by the rating agencies are now uh, uh, not invest, no, no junk, they're not investment credit anymore. And as a result, uh, could lead to market dislocation if the number of companies that experience this transition is too large. And obviously COVID is the kind of shock that uh, it, uh, would lead to a lot of investment grade companies right at the border between IG and high yield to become high yield. And in order to prevent market dislocations um, from these so-called fallen angels, uh, did the Fed decide to buy high yield credits at the very upper end of the eligibility spectrum? Uh, so, so that's why they did it. Um, uh, and likewise, to lobbying, this could lead to more and more. And we had uh, uh, comments by uh, uh, Secretary of the Treasury, Mnuchin, a few weeks ago uh, that he was now considering high yield energy companies to be eligible su uh, for support across the board, not just those that would be fallen angels, which is a good example for lobbying pressure leading to an expansion of the mandate. And these things typically only go in one direction, more and not less. So as Milton Friedman uh, uh, you know, famously said, there's nothing as permanent as a temporary government program. Uh, and this applies to the policy dimension um, as just discussed, but it could also apply to the institutional dimension. And just as a you know, food for thought out there for, for students is uh, that we now have really the Fed uh, uh, having gained this additional role in uh, executing fiscal policy. Uh, and this reading questions uh, about fiscal uh, independence, about uh, so-called fiscal dominance, where the, uh, the agent of the government will basically uh, uh, dominate uh, 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 decision-making by the Fed. And that could have far lasting consequences for the conduct to Fed policy more generally further down the road. And just finally on, on modern monetary theory, um, I think it's important here to distinguish shades of grays and not just black and white. Just because we don't see inflation 
doesn't mean that modern monetary theory applies. There is a huge difference between this and there are a lot of good reasons why classical theory would uh, uh, explain uh, us why currently inflation is low. I won't go through the argument. Uh, you cannot take the absence of inflation as a proof for the validity of modern monetary theory. Okay, yeah. In fact, one of the things, the big thing is uh, is sort of this distinction between central banks and government and governments and uh, is, is completely become blurred. And that is an issue for democracies and, and generally. I think we're out of time. I think we could go on because the issues are so huge. But uh, I think uh, we have to let you all go and, uh, you know, we'll have uh, lots of opportunities in the future to keep uh, discussing these issues because they're not going away uh, uh, any, any time soon. So uh, thank you all for great questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Schultz and Professor Fleider. And uh, thank you, uh, Professor Lowry, for allowing me to uh, host this uh, session. I'm really sorry we couldn't see our guest, but, uh, uh, but uh, thank you all for engagement. And thank you, Anat, for such a great session. We really appreciate your time and um, putting this together. And thank all our guests for coming and giving some comments at the end.